Yeah. Yeah. So um, anyone that is currently watching right now, I see there's a couple people. We're about to go live for the first time ever. We have a weekly podcast that we do Monday at 5 p.m. Eastern time. And you could listen to it Tuesday when you wake up, wherever you listen to podcasts. It's on Spotify. It's wherever you listen to podcasts, podcast app. And this is our first time going live. And we're going to be going live every week now. We have an awesome guest that about to call in a second. Paul Gatti. Mike, give him the proper intro. Paul is my best friend from high school, brother from another mother. Uh, we go way back. He hooked me up with my junior prom date. We went down to senior prom together. We, we had some insane times. He's the man, the legend. He has an insane insurance startup that he was at the forefront of the industry. I couldn't even tell you his vision with this was so sophisticated. I like to think of myself as someone that understands things pretty well, Dan, with comprehension. Paul was so ahead of his time a few years ago with insurance that I was having a hard time understanding where he was going with this thing. And clearly he was on to something great because what he's about to tell us about this uh, program, he's getting involved with this accelerator, brought him in. He's absolutely crushing it and is making sophistication, sophisticated insurance seem easy. So remember before Uber, when you couldn't get a ride with the click of a thumb or before we were around with food delivery, insurance has always been complicated. Most people don't understand it. You're about to hear from the guy that knows more than anything on anybody on the planet about insurance. And here he is, there he is. himself, Paul Gagliotti. What's up, buddy? How's it going, boys? Doing well, man. How you doing? Just doing well, enjoying our time here in the suburbs. That's. For I, sure. I wanted to preface this, Paul, by thanking you for letting me anchor your apartment. I'm actually, for our listeners, Paul has been graciously letting me work out of his apartment. I have an Airbnb that coincidentally is two floors up. And the way Airbnb works, you don't even find out about the address until after you book for safety purposes. I end up booking, I see Paul's address two floors up. And he's in uh, New Jersey at his mom's house right now. And I probably should have listened to him and gone with him weeks ago to quarantine there. But I went against that wise move. And I've been stuck in the city. But Paul's apartment's been empty. And it's been giving me at least a change of scenery from two floors above where I'm sleeping. So appreciate it, man. As you can see, hey. Paul's us in his background. Yeah, a anything for you, Mike. Anything for you. Dan looking man. good as always. Dan's always <laughs> looking good. Too. So, to, Paul, to tell us up. about you. Uh, you brought me into this in my Scrubs campaign through your network. Can you break down what's been going on with that for starters? Yeah, absolutely. You know, Mike and Dan, I appreciate the opportunity to be on this legendary podcast surrounded by legends. Uh, so thank you guys. Um, so yeah, um, ourselves, including, um, you know, the folks over at Lodell and a bunch of under their entrepreneurs uh, came together to help feed our frontline medical workers. So all these people that are risking their lives to help people in the New York City metro area, uh, we came together uh, solve the problem. And of course, talking to the food delivery gurus over here, you guys can understand is feeding people. Uh, so in the, we've been alive for about 10 days, right, Mike? About 10 days yeah. now we've been live. 10 days uh, later, uh, over 2000 uh, meals served already with another uh, several thousand slated for this week. Uh, so we're excited about that. Uh, we're taking donations on inmyscrubs.com. All the money goes directly to those. Uh, it's really a pretty brilliant group that's putting it together. I mean, you have all these alphas in this Slack channel all coming together to solve problems, which is more extraordinary, actually, than the group effort is watching these individual wheelers and dealers, you know, put their egos aside for a, a bigger picture to help people. Yeah, that, it's been, that's what I love about New York, Paul, is during, you know, I, it's been weird moving back here with this going on, but I actually, I'm grateful that I've been able to see New Yorkers at their best because, you know, for those of you that have never been in New York, sometimes it gets a bad rep with people thinking New Yorkers are assholes. It's the exact opposite, actually. They are the most kind and genuine human beings. And when shit hits the fan, that's who you want in your corner. And we're seeing that, which is... It's definitely going to make me appreciate living in New York way more, Paul, when the dust settles on us. No, oh, absolutely. I mean, it's a great city. We're going to get Dan out there soon, too. You know what I mean? Oh, so, yeah. you know, we got to get, you know, the legendary Dan Roland, you know, living in the Big Apple. It's a great time now, right? You know, it's going to be a good time to lease something, <laughs> Dan. I think it's going to work out really well for you. 
Yeah, Dan, <laughs> with his uh, current setup with Danny, I mean, with her career taking off in broadcasting, New York might be a, uh, a foundation sooner than later. Fingers crossed. Right. I think so. Double fingers crossed. Boom, baby. There. there we go. Oh, that's it. That- that is that's the plan. I do I do expect to be in the Big Apple in the near future. That that is part of the plan. Now we're talking. Here first, we're here. people. Hell yeah! <laughs> I just I needed a little pit stop, play some golf, a little suntan going. You know, 100%. check out the South a little. Absolutely. Yeah, you guys get it. Yeah. So, Paul, tell Absolutely. us, man. You, I was prefacing this before you came on, kind of giving your background in insurance. I was explaining to everybody how complicated your industry is, and when you first brought up your vision to me a few years ago, you were so ahead of the time. I like to think of myself as a pretty bright guy, but not on that level where I had no idea what you were even talking about. I was trying to be a supportive best friend. And I'm like, is this guy just batshit crazy, insane? Like, what's he talking about? But there was, you were just ahead of your time and you were onto something on another level. Can you break down for starters, what exactly made you get into that train of thought in the first place with insurance well i mean you know topical being that this uh you know podcast is bootstrapping the trenches right so you know like was running my company i'd started um a couple years before um you know basically i always tell people and mike and dan could agree to this you know always have a whiteboard in your house uh it always Mm. seems to work out pretty well uh you know and me mike and uh you know a good friend of ours uh the conjurer you know kind of talking about how (laughs) what we do is different and et cetera, et cetera. And I was like, you know, I was like, there's really no good software products. Here's why da, 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 and just sketched it out. And I was like, you know, we're going to do this. Like, fuck it. Like we're, we're going. And they're like, really? I'm like, yeah. Like, I really think that this could work. And, you know, uh, you know, fast forward, uh, four years in two months at this point, it's April already. This was about June, uh, 2016. And, uh, now here we are, uh, we're in, uh, we got ourselves in plug and play, which is uh, one of the most respected, uh, accelerators in the world. Uh, a little upsetting with the whole COVID situation. You know, I can't be out in Silicon Valley, but you know, bigger things to, um, to handle. Uh, so it's been a quite an extraordinary journey, uh, now, and we're really just getting started. So we're really excited about what the future holds. So Paul, what do you see the future holding for yourself in this space? Because you've been called a trailblazer, a unicorn recently by, institutional investors that when you hear those types of words thrown around, it's a very good thing, especially coming from people with deep pockets. So where do you see your space and your platform heading in the next couple of years? So, I mean, like, I think the world in general is going to shift and, you know, the value of a worker is going to be rethought. So I just think that it's a really good opportunity for anybody. I think the level of opportunities out there is going to be a lot more than there were, uh, you know, in the past, believe it or not. So I kind of just see things as, you know, changing uh, for the positive. So in my industry, you know, it's a $5 trillion uh, global industry, you know, powers everything. It's really topical right now, whether it be health insurance or insurance for loss of income or people, you know, heaven forbid, getting sick at their job. So I think the worker of the future um, is going to be this gig style worker that does multiple things, right? They're not just a um, car salesman anymore. Now they're a insurance salesman or a driver for Lodell and an insurance salesman and an Uber driver. So I see that the gig economy is going to change how things that we didn't think would be gig related um, are going to be in the future. Dan, what I find fascinating about what Paul envisions with this, no one ever brought to my attention, or I've never heard before, notion of an Uber driver picking up a passenger and have, being able to be an actual insurance agent on the fly and vice versa, where they can actually work together, the rider and the driver. So I think there's a lot to think about in that realm. And it's absolutely phenomenal. When you use that train of thought, Paul, it's fascinating because you've got two people in a car. Lately, they've been, I mean, the way it's worked for years, someone needs to ride, somebody picks them up. The notion of those two people working together on the ride, that's that's unique. What, What triggered that coming to mind for you? I mean, you know, it's like you know, if you've ever been in some of these, you know, really, you know, well thought out Ubers, like they're trying to sell you all sorts of shit. So I was like, well, you know, like 
some of these guys and gals are just great salespeople and why they have your time for this, you know, I'm not sure that put on your headphones and don't talk to me type, you know, they have a, a time with you to try and uh, sell you something. And some of these you'll see with ads, you know, I'm sure all of us on this call for sure have taken enough ride chairs to have been in the ones in major metros where they put a tablet in front of you and it's surfacing an ad. So what's really much different than that person, you know, communicating that ad, you know, you look at, you know, I know the gents on this call know about, you know, wrapping, you know, buses with advertising, right. Or New York city, you see the tops of cabs have advertising. So I figure why not bring that inside um, the vehicle and have a person doing it where they're not actually doing anything on that. It's really just like, hey, you have a phone, right? You used a rideshare app. So, you know, pre-qualifier right there. Hey, do you need insurance? Sure. Like, you know, go to, you know, um, harborai.com slash, you know, Mike rolls the driver and, you know, um, you know, you can buy insurance and I get credit for it. What makes you think that uh, just a everyday person like me would trust a Uber driver to buy insurance from them? It's a great, great question. I don't think you do, right? But I think you trust the platform just like you trust Uber to put you in touch with a good driver that's going to drive safely, right? So it really has little to do with the driver so much as the platform that's behind them. But that's a great question. You know, I mean, I, I think about it all the time. And also, when you think about it, if you're willing to trust your life with someone driving you around, you know, like I'd be down to trust that person with insurance if I'm getting in a car with them and they're dropping me off safely and I have a pleasant conversation. Yeah, I mean, Dan makes a great point, though, right? You know, like what's yeah. trust and what level of it, you know, is makes sense. And I, I think that's a really a very thoughtful question. And, you know, so that, what's up? Is Dan? that kind of like I'm, I'm just trying to understand because I know, Mike, I know you know all about it. I've never really heard the down of what it is that you're doing with the technology with the insurance and that's why i was like really pumped to get on this because just to ask is that kind of uh, the basis of it is being able to make insurance something that everyday people could like swap with each other is that what the platform idea is yeah it's a great guy yeah, oh, yeah. So Dan, a great another great point yeah it, it's so like we look at it like what's the crux of what we do right like we sell a product largely no one ever wants to buy, right? Like you guys sell something I want. I want to eat, right? I'm hungry. I want that pizza. It may not be good for me, but I want it, right? With insurance, like no one's beating the doors down to buy insurance, right? But it's a necessity. And we're seeing in today's world, especially the level of sophistication and importance of like proper insurance. So, you know, what I as it needs to be more approachable, right? And similar to that of borrowing the rideshare example, um, similar to that, I think that if you're able to provide it in a more approachable manner where you're confident that an Uber driver really isn't doing anything, right? Like our engineers thought it out, our insurance thought leaders thought it out. So this product that you largely don't wanna deal with to begin with, is a lot more approachable and easier to handle. And using our AI technology allows us to do that in a way that, you know, is gonna take a sophisticated transaction and allow it to be brought through that whole life cycle. Okay. Basically, you Paul know, Paul, well, I was just gonna say, Paul, like the, the stuff, the brass tacks of insurance that most people get, that's like really easy to get, or that's one thing, but he asks the questions that people don't even know they have. And it, it's going to make any type of insurance way easier to obtain. Like we've talked about dabbling with liquor delivery or whatever it might be. And Paul's alleviating those barriers. So you're almost like talking about introducing people to different types of insurance that aren't mainstream, that they don't even really know exist where I might get in an Uber and all of a sudden find out about a different type of insurance plan that I didn't even know existed that might be like really beneficial to me. Yeah, or it could just be like any other advertising, right? Like why do insurance companies, you know, monopolize the ad space? Because like, oh shit, I gotta buy renter's insurance because that Geico commercial brought it to my attention, right? So similarly, it could be just simply opportunistic where that person is just like, hey, you know, you know, you know, it's uh, it's crazy out there these days. Do you have this type of insurance? And you could be like, no, shit, I really need to buy that right now. Like, what what do I do? I, I was supposed to have it for a month and I don't. So like, it could be that uh, making things more approachable. Absolutely, too, Dan. It's a great point. You know, you're, you're going to make things a little bit more understandable. 
to people by making the process consistent. Um, and I think that's something, you know, uh, you know, learning from your guys' business and watching you guys grow is, you know, you learned how to make a sophisticated process as simple while still keeping it very sophisticated as possible. And, and just going back to, you know, the, you know, the, the Lodell example, right? Like, you know, watching Mike interact with people, you know what I mean? With his encyclopedic knowledge of food delivery is, is incredible, right? Like you see these people like, you know, like, holy shit, I never would have thought that. And he's like, yeah, we've been learning about that for a while. So similarly, it's kind of like, taking that knowledge transfer from myself who's been doing it what I would consider relatively successfully for the past decade and being like, Hey, you know, uh, this person in this new economy that was already transitioning to what it will be after whatever's going on in the world today. Right. Like it's going to be whatever that is. So I kind of looked at it beforehand of saying, Hey, look, let's help the people that need the most help. And those are like the single parents, right? Those are the elderly people that are just getting out of the workplace. You know, it could be someone disabled that has to stay in their home. In addition to the Uber driver, right? The person that's out there, but this is someone that can utilize a platform from largely any device with, you know, a a relatively updated web browser um, and decent web service speed, you know, and they're able to go and do it. So I think that really helps. And, you know, it's going to bring, the um, economic impact of these larger brokers and just bring it down to the individual level, which will really benefit the people that are, you know, that are using it. So, so Paul, let me ask you, are you in the process? I know we've talked offline a lot about this with your funding right now. Are you in the process with this whole uh, Corona going on? You were about to head out to Silicon Valley for plug and play right before this got serious. So for one, is that, has that been going on virtually and twofold with that? Are you in the process of raising a Series A? What What's your objective financially right now with this? Yeah, great question. So, yeah, I mean, plug and play, um, you know, the biggest class act of them all. Uh, there are brilliant folks that work there and they shifted an in-person environment online in a amount of time that is just astonishing. Um, so everything we're doing right now is remote, obviously, you know, it's like everything's touch and go. Everybody right now is touch and go in the world. Right. So we're seeing, hopefully, you know, um, you know, a couple months we'll be able to get out there. Um, they are shifting some things so we can, you know, take advantage of things, um, that we wouldn't have taken advantage of before. Um, so that's pretty good. Um, you know, we are doing, you know, our first like uh, uh, friends and family, uh, capital raise, um, which is good. Uh, you know, we did a significant one and almost, you know, you know, more than a million and a half dollars previously, but now we're doing that. Uh, and it's by finding very interesting is that we've had a lot of um, interest uh, recently um, in light of a lot of the events because our platform solves a lot of the problems of what we see is, you know, people are showing they can largely work from home, uh, you know, uh, and how that uh, economically impacts companies, I think is yet to be determined, right? Like what the, you know, Mike working in an office, which is a oxymoron, right? Like, you know, like in itself, like Mike's not an office guy, right? The three of us ironically on this are not the biggest office guys, but are the hardest worker in the rooms kind of guys. So, you know, you're seeing that and, you know, so uh, yeah, I mean, you know, we're, we're doing it. Uh, we're really excited. We have a lot of people really interested uh, in getting involved in our, in our round. And, uh, you know, we've expedited certain things based on the current climate to be able to help as many people as possible. So, uh, you know, we're really excited about that. And I think you're one of the winners that'll come out of this with your industry. When you think about social distancing and the contactless transactions, with what you're building, I think the timing is impeccable now for you pulling this up. I mean, you know, we saw businesses shifting. Uh, I'm actually doing another um, podcast uh, later this week um, with the uh, with some folks um, uh, about that. And yeah, I mean, you know, like, as I said, the economy was in flux and all all of us on this podcast, I would agree, would agree with that, right? Like that it, it was changing before. What's happening now is it's just expedited certain components of that change to a level of like, now it's just going to go zero to a hundred where certain things like we have people that, you know, call them competitors. Um, we're unique because most of our competitors we can work with. So um, they're, they can be value partners, but if you were to call them competitors or, or people in our space, you know, their model was largely a little old school, like they had call centers. Uh, and I think a call center model is being challenged right now. I don't think it's dead by any means, but it's being challenged. And what does that mean? 
mean now? And how do you distribute people in an environment where it makes sense? Mm. Yeah, it's, uh, it's interesting to see, thinking about the trends that are going to come from this that will stick and what's going to just go back to normal. Like it's interesting even thinking about all these people on these Zoom networking conferences every day now. I mean, Paul, do you think things are going to ever be back to normal the way they were with the way people were out and about? Or do you think there will be certain things that are stuck in stone with working from home taking off on another level now? I mean, I think that certain things will definitely change, period. Uh, it's just the nature of what it is. Like, I'm most curious about things like nightlife, you know, how that's going to look. I think that you're going to see, you know, more companies like me and my staff, right? We're like eight people or something. There's every day there's you know, more people being interviewed or whatever. But I think that's where we're at, even though I'm a CEO, don't quote me on that, uh, uh, you know, because my partner's constantly hiring people. Um, but you know, I think, you know, like for me, frankly, like I was never a big fan of working from home. And the only reason why was it was such an honor for me to be able to earn the opportunity to have an office, right? Like, mm -hmm. so for me, that milestone in starting my business was great. Like I'm talking to you now from where I sat, ironically, nine years ago when I originally started my business. And to me, all I could think about was getting out of home because home wasn't cool. Like I needed an office. That was cool. That was, you know, a coming of age moment for me and my business. Um, so I see that changing. Um, I also just see the way people interacting with other people is going to inevitably change. Right. But, you know, people said this and we were younger, but we grew up in, you know, uh, you know, a bedroom community for New York city when nine 11 happened and they're called oh, the city will never be the same. The city got better you know, from that. And I think this is another example of the city leveling up uh, New York City and these major metros because people are helping people like we are with our charity, you know, to watch these people pour all this time into helping people they will never meet. Right. And, you know, uh, to be large, that could be largely unnoticed in most things, I think is a pretty amazing feat. Um, so, yeah, I mean, I think that it's just going to be different, you know, and, and how people you know interact. I love how you said that, uh, getting into an office was a privilege and like that. That was such a interesting point kind of at home, not necessarily saying that I felt that way, but maybe I should have felt that way. Where Like you get to a point where your business is doing well enough that you could pay for a place to do business, which when you look back, all the big companies, like they all have offices. So if you get to a point where you've got an office, especially you in New York city, it's like that first pat on the shoulder moment where you're on your way. Yeah, I mean, you're so right. Like, and I think a lot of times, like, you know, like, like with us, like as being builders, like the three of us are on this, right? Like you kind of lose sight sometimes of like the simple things. Like I miss, and, and Mike knows this, like I spend more time in my office than anywhere else. That's my home, right? I really care more about that space than any other space because I spend so much time and it's where I get a lot of my creativity from just because it's that flow state of grind uh, that you're in where you go and do that. So I, again, I'm not a work from home kind of fan, right? Like, so, so like it, for me, this is really challenging uh, even though I can work from anywhere, like we have an AI platform, right? But like, and I think, you know, doubling it back on to like Mike and, you know, Dan, like you guys, like you guys work from anywhere, right? Like you guys operate in markets. It'd be in literally impossible for you guys to service the market you work in without not being there, right? Like you have to not be there, like for what you guys are, you're too, you know, you have too many different places and we work, you know, we have clients all over the world. And, you know, I look at it like, you know, thinking about my industry for what it was, which was old school, someone coming to your kitchen table and, you know, you have, uh, you know, your, your spouse cooking and you're a farmer and, you know what I mean? They're insuring your crops and your farmhouse and your life insurance. I think that that model, people selling to people, is what we're doing with our technology. It's a tool to help people sell to people. I think it's one of the things that comes full circle. And I think that after this, ironically, people are going to want to go into offices again, right? They, they used to hate the routine, the rat race, whatever. But again, to your point, it was a privilege, right? It was a privilege to be there. And I think ironically, as fun as it is to work from home, right? People like experiences. And that's why I think the way after all of this, you know, goes forward, uh, what experiences look like, 
I think it'd be very, very interesting. And within that, I think for the entrepreneurs listening and out there, the opportunity is freaking immense. Like you're going to be able to see things you didn't even think were things that will be things now. Like I think you're going to see like in major metros like New York City, there's going to be far more electric vehicles. There already was like little scooters and skateboards. And, you know, I, I reluctantly left my electric skateboard in New York City, uh, you know, and a uh, little oh, set it up. That better. Around. You should ride around. Yeah, it's great. You know, you know, it's another, that was another con, you know, conjism there. He was like, yo, check this right. skateboard out. You know, it was great skateboard, you know? So like, I'm looking at another one, right? Cause I'm like, well, you know, like subway's fun. It's convenient. It's easy. It's very inexpensive, but like, you know, like for the foreseeable future, you know, like I want to be, you know, smart because I do want to go back to my office and technically us, like we're deemed an essential business being that we're an insurance. So like I, you know, our, you know, lovely attorney, you know, gave us a letter where we could go and travel, you know, which is, you know, uh, part of what it is. And, you know, um, so, you know, for me, I, I, I can't wait to get back in it. You know, it's be hard for them to tell me I can't go back in it, you know, um, and it's, I, they've been talking me out of going back into it. So, you know, like, I don't know like how that's going to It's work. fascinating, man, because I feel like all I keep hearing about is, oh, is working from home going to become more of just a thing now? And you're it's enlightening thinking at the opposite end of, oh, I'm looking forward to getting back to the office because I haven't been hearing anyone bring up things in that light. Well, I, I think it's going to adjust. Know, yeah, yeah. I've, I've heard some people that I think working from home has a lot of negatives and very few positives, actually. And people think that it's just all glamour because they're so used to working in the office and the idea of working from home you kind of think like, oh, I could just do anything. But at the end of the day, it's tough to be as productive when you're working out of the same place that you eat breakfast in, you eat dinner in, you chill out in and watch a movie at night and just wind down. I, I, I think we've always kind of struggled with it a little bit. And it, it was something where when I knew this was all starting, I, I think Mike for our company, I thought to myself like, you know what, this gives us a little bit of an edge because our competitors aren't used to this. And this is what we've been doing for years. We've figured out how to make this work, the whole work from home thing. But I think there's a lot of companies that you know have big time pump the brakes as far as production goes because they're not used to it. And when you have like an hour long zoom video each day and then you go back to all just doing your thing and you got like kids in the background or your girlfriend or your wife or whatever it might be like, it's tough to get shit done when you're working from home. There's no doubt about it. Yeah. No, you're, you're so right. You know, you're so right, Dan. I agree. And with that, Paul, like we always talk about routines for entrepreneurs. What have you, have there been certain staples for you that, you've been sticking with even while this quarantine is going on the lockdown where, you know, day to day stuff that you've just been able to stick with to keep even keel through all this. I mean, like, to be honest, like I could do a better job, but, you know, up early, get some sort of exercise, you know, be consistent, you know, like I'm a breakfast person and that can be on the grow, go kind of breakfast. I just start too early to not fuel myself. Right. Like I have to do that. Right. So I think consistency, like anything else is key. Like you have to be consistent, whether you're not at home or not. Like my commute right now is a flight of stairs, right? Okay, great. But like, it's still technically my commute, right? And I think to Dan's point, you have to create a space that is a workspace. And look, that could be on your couch and that's fine. No issue with that. But like, there has to be a time where it's, this is work time. This is break time. This is play time, et cetera. So I think that's the biggest thing, which I would say, and just consistency and, you know, be consistent. Yeah, it makes sense. What have you been doing food wise, Paul? Have you been ordering delivery a lot? Have you been cooking? What's been going on out in the suburbs of Jersey with yeah, that? I saw some pretty amazing Instagram stories. They've been cooking <sighs> some bomb ass oh, shit. Oh, no, <laughs> We've been definitely cooking, right? Um, you know, we've definitely been cooking, you know. Um, thanks, Dan. Dan brought me our lovely attorney, he brought me a beverage. Oh, um, thanks a lot, Dan. So, um, we've been cooking a lot, man. Uh, all sorts of stuff. Um, Italian, a lot of pastas. Um, we, uh, I saw some restaurant once, as Dan was probably alluding to, where they took 
rigatoni pasta, which for the viewers aren't sure, it's a, it's like a, a noodle with a hollow center, right? And you put it down. So I cooked those three quarters away, put them in a circular dish, lined them all up vertically, and basically made like a vertical rigatoni lasagna out of it. It came out pretty bomb. Um, made some dope ribs today. Uh, you know, I live in a very small apartment. If Mike panned out, you get the whole apartment in half a shot, right? So um, the cooking yeah. surface is tiny. So, you know, I really also, you know, regained my love for cooking in like a, a kitchen that could accommodate it. So all sorts of delivery game strong out here. Um, so a lot of good pizza and stuff like that, but being that it is the suburbs, it's nowhere near what we're used to in New York city, which is, you know, the thousand plus restaurants you can get delivered to your door. And even here, man, since you've been in Jersey, a lot of those restaurants have shut down. So it's not, it's almost like a tease because you go on these apps and there's only like eight or nine options, which is crazy being in New York. I was talking about that yesterday. It feels like we're in like a Logan, Utah market when we're in the big apple and it's, it's wild. Yeah. You know, I think it all comes back, right. You know, like it, it's got, cause I think like, even if restaurants fail, like and there some certainly will, and they have already. Right. Uh, I think it's also a great time for people to start a restaurant. Right. And mm. the landlords are going to be super into that. That's why I think coming out of this, it's like any other, you know, what's that wall street saying, right. When there's blood on the streets, you buy and, you know, and I think that's where we are now. And I think from an opportunity perspective, you know, like, dude, before this call, I spent, you know, 40 minutes on a glitchy uh, chase.com app for my payroll protect, uh, protection loan for my business, right? Like, that's what being an entrepreneur is, right? Sitting there all frustrated, like, why doesn't this work? You know what I mean? Et cetera, et cetera. You know, we're in a fortunate position where, you know, we're still ramping our business. Um, but, you know, I think that like the opportunity for other businesses to start now is going to be insane. So um, I think it's going to be pretty sick. I think you're going to see some brilliant people get opportunities to crush. Um, and especially in the restaurant business, I'm really excited to see what's going to come out of there. Because I think hospitality is going to go back to the root of the word of being hospitable, which in New York City got a little, little testy <laughs> so in, in recent times. Yeah, yeah. That, that's going to be interesting. Yeah, it's kind of like just it's almost like you're going to a country that's never been explored before and you're landing a boat on it for the first time and everyone's just like running out for the very first time trying to make a name for themselves. That's what it feels like is going to happen when the world reopens, because obviously there's all these companies that are going to still be around. But like the middle size, smaller size companies, most of them, unfortunately, probably won't. And there's going to be that huge gap of people that are going to need to fill the gap. And yeah, there's going to be banks loaning hundreds of billions of dollars for new startups. And it's going to be a time for growth. There's no doubt about it. It's, it's exciting to think about it, actually. Yeah, no, you're so right, Dan. Like, you know, I think, Dan, too, like what you're going to see is like, you know, like, you know, like businesses need to be businesses again. Like the bullshit's going to be gone. Right. These ridiculous capital raises on to be gone a long time ago and now they're finally going to be gone and that's really important for everybody in the economy because what it does is it focuses resources on the things that will actually work right not concepts um and i think that's really really important especially going forward because i think that our job market i believe rebounds personally i do i think they're different though i don't you're not going back to what you were doing right like you're gonna go back to you're going to go to this thing. And I think that so long as it's done correctly, you know, people are going to have a great opportunity for maybe a second act or some people a third act, you know what I mean? To get out there. And, you know, so long as they're willing to do things, you know, I, I think that, you know, you know, just for what we're seeing with the charity we're working on, you know, and, and Mike can see it cause he's getting his hands dirty. Like I am, you know, I, and everybody else involved, like you're getting some pretty crazy unique people to deliver on some pretty awesome things. And you're seeing that people are putting it all aside and doing it. And, you know, you guys can attest, you know, we've been able to feed all these people. If I told you guys who are in the food delivery business that we could feed a couple thousand people in two weeks, you'd be like, you're on drugs, like no way. Right. You know, and we've been able to do that, right. With help of people that know how to do it, but we've been able to actually do that. Yeah, it's been pretty remarkable. I mean, and Paul, that's what's been cool. We're doing, we're following in our college towns with this, 
with the front workers and the gross, all the essential workers. That's what I've really taken from this is it's more than just the doctors and nurses. It's the grocery clerks, delivery drivers. Um, you know, Dan, I think we have Paul on mute there. Did you, can you unmute him? I think he muted himself. Oh, really? Yeah, I, I didn't mute him. I, I don't think I have a way to unmute him either. Oh, wait, never mind. Yeah? Wait, yeah, I, I can't unmute him. The mic isn't connected, it's saying. Oh. I'm sure he'll unmute. Long. Yes. This is a, yeah, there I, you know, I really, like, I really like streaming. This is a great platform. Yeah, thanks for Hala Taha. Shout out to her for getting us. Yeah, Paul, you're back. I think. Um, but yeah, this has been phenomenal. I wanted to ask Paul what his last meal on earth was going to be. Figured that would be a good way to end this. You got to think it's some dope Italian dish, Dan. Wait, so Paul, I, I don't know if your mic's working, but are you basically saying that you don't think that these venture capitalist groups are going to be giving money to quote unquote growth companies that are like pre-revenue or pre-profits? companies that like don't necessarily have an immediate plan to make money, but like, for example, in our he case, can't hear, us, he can't hear us. Oh, he can't even hear us. No. Uh, I thought it was um, just a headphone. Um, no, I mean, it's showing that his mic's back on. It might just be the headphones now. I'm sure he's figuring it out here. Yeah. Well, we've had some people tune in about this process. I think uh, Mook was watching for a bit. And some other people, Luis Morago is tuned in. Oh yeah, appreciate all the listeners and yeah, and then yeah, yeah. Cool. Uh, yeah, it's one of those things where uh, Paul, you know, like I said, we go way back. It's awesome seeing him build with his business and vision, and seeing his team too, Dan, going from working it out of his garage at his parents' house to now he just not only had an office, he had to upgrade because he now has a team of eight. I remember when he was a one man band, which I know you and I can attest to the whole bootstrapped in the trenches. And he said a lot of enlightening things. Oh, young man, what's up, pal? How are you, Miles? Yeah, Miles on the podcast. Mr. Charleston, good to see you. <laughs> Looking great, buddy. <laughs> yeah, uh, so yeah, Miles is Dan's Jack Russell Terrier. He's been known to have numerous nicknames over the years based on where he is geographically. When we first crossed paths, I thought he was a mix of a Japanese and French dog. So I called him Monsieur. And we also had Mr. Miyagi in there for a while. Uh, Mr. Scissors was a popular nickname. Dan's anointed him. Can you guys hear me now? Oh, there we are. He's back. Paul, Dan was just asking you, you want to go into it, Dan, about the VCs? Yeah, I was just kind of asking you to clarify on your prediction. Are you kind of predicting that venture cap companies aren't going to be investing in like growth stories that don't necessarily have their eyes on profitability or on revenues, like companies that don't have an immediate plan to actually, as you put it, like be a real business. Well, I think venture capital still exists, right? You know what I mean? Of course. And yeah. It, it, it's still good. I just think that they just reevaluate what is an investment and what does it make sense in, right? Because I think that like, like, um, the shiny things that you would attract a traditional VC. Cause you know, they need to get Buku return, right? Like that's all that really matters is like return. I think of course that still matters. It does, if anything, it might be more important. Right. But I think it's more like what actually works and how it works and why it's going to make them money. That's my prediction. So, I mean, like we're getting a lot of people that are calling us and, you know, like, look, these funds still have money. They have lockout periods, you know, that's not going to stop. I just think the cycle of it evolves a little bit. So it's not just going to be like throwing darts at a wall anymore and seeing what sticks. It'll be more precision. That's what I, that's my opinion. I think so. I agree. I, I completely agree. I think, like you said, everything's cyclical. We've had this raging economy for so long and we'll get back there, but you know, there's going to take some time where people have to pick their spots widely. And I, I think guys like us can be winners during this era with the, uh, the service necessity businesses we're in, insurance, delivery, they're both things people need ongoing, right? Absolutely. Sure. I think so, for sure. So, Paul, what would you say food-wise? We've got to end this on that. What it would be your last meal on earth? Obviously, no calories matter. Just go into town. 
I, I mean, I, I got to stick with Wohop, man. I had to do something at Wohop. I think the dumpling game, you know, obviously, I know you're a big dumpling guy. Oh, yeah. A little dumpling action, you know, some Gerald's House chicken, some lo mein. Um, can't wait for that, to be honest with oh, you. Yeah, I can't wait to go with you there. About. So. I know. We take for granted being able to go out to eat. I can't wait to be able to do that again. But that's been Me a major when, you know? Danny when said, do you Whoa. think I'll be able when do you think I'll be? No, I heard. I cut my headphones in. When do you think I'll be able to get on a plane and come see you guys? What's your prediction for that? I mean, like, I think, and I want to be optimistic, obviously, because, like, there's no point in being pessimistic. The world's already fucked up enough right now, right? So, like, <laughs> why make it that much worse? I mean, I don't know. I mean, New York streams are getting a little bit better. I mean, New York is very, very bad for anybody listening. It's really sad for such a beautiful city like you know to see it um the city never sleeps is beginning to sleep which is kind of wild uh i I mean a couple months you know like what's a couple months it could be four six weeks it could be 10 um you know i i think that it's gonna you know it's gonna be an interesting summer right interesting spring summer but you know a couple months max yeah I'm guessing Memorial Day weekend is when things really that that to me I know Trump wanted Easter Monday Sunday at first which was not realistic at all but I think Memorial Day weekend is when we're going to see things actually be the benchmark where you start seeing that being the get together that people are really yearning Absolutely for. yeah you know It's ridiculous I uh, I'm down in South Carolina obviously and it's almost like today the first day the state realized that the COVID-19 exists. Like no joke, an hour before this podcast, the TV turns like one of those special alerts and I got it on my phone. And it was basically like announcing the pandemic where it's like, really? Like this is, it was absurd. It was like, wild. stay at home. Yeah, they were like, stay at home unless you have to leave your home. Like COVID-19 is running rampant in SC, like South Carolina. And I was just like, aren't you guys literally six weeks late on this notice? Like there, it's... Dude, you but, see uh, Mardi Gras, the governor down there was letting, and it obviously has gone rampant how bad it is in Louisiana. You had people raging on Mardi Gras at the end of February, like just mobs on the streets. Like he just wasn't even getting a shit. It was crazy. Yeah, so, and that's yeah. turning into one of the new epicenters for this shit, New Orleans. I think it's tough when you're not in New York the last few weeks or the area. Like, Paul, if you're not on the East Coast where we've been, it's tough to take this as seriously when you're not seeing it and engulfed in it. Like, even seeing in your apartment that ambulance taking that person out from downstairs the other day. Like, that's happening right here. So I think it's tough to visualize when you're not within shouting distance to the magnitude of it, especially when it's non, not as dense areas. When you think of how dense New York is, it seems way more impactful than these spread out places. Although as we're seeing, they're going to be hit hard too, because they're not taking proper precautions. Yeah. It's, it's sad. You know, it's the old, like, it's just, um, you know, I mean, how do you plan for something like this? I I don't think you can personally, you know, so like all this stuff aside, like you could say whatever you want. Right. But this hasn't happened for a hundred years. And you, can you compare medical technology from today to a hundred years ago? No. Could you compare globalization a hundred years ago to what it is today? No. You know, like, could you, could you compare like appreciation of life to what it was a hundred years ago? No. You know, I, I, I just don't think you can compare anything to this. And I, it's just one of those situations that in a years from now, we're going to look back at it. Like, what the fuck was that? We'll never forget it. We'll remember it. it'll be, you know, our like, you know, nine 11 type of thing. And unfortunately far more people are going to die. Um, they have died, I believe. I don't know the exact numbers. But I'm pretty sure more people have died than I think my level was like four or five thousand people in the U.S. I think um, today, actually, officially, New York surpassed the death toll from 9/11, like 3,200 something people. Where they actually yeah, that, made an announcement this morning that that unfortunately that, that that's which is crazy to think about. I thought 9/11 was like in the high 2000s. I that's think it was yeah, a couple thousand. Yeah. Oh, yeah. It wasn't, it wasn't more than a couple thousand, for sure. Yeah. You're definitely, I think you're right, Dan. Yeah. So that's uh, pretty alarming to think about. Hopefully this thing is going to start 
or has peaked, we'll see in the days and weeks ahead. It seems like people have gotten a bit too optimistic the last couple of days out of nowhere. And I think that's a bit pre, uh, too premature. So fingers crossed that we'll be able to be getting woe hop together here, Paul, sooner rather than later, man. Hoping for it, my friend. I'm definitely hoping yeah. for it. Yeah. And dude, I'll be there as well. Hell yeah. Yeah, we'll all have to do that. And dude, really appreciate the time. Love you and stay healthy out Love there. You guys. Thank you guys, man. Appreciate the looks, you know. Of course. And thank you guys very much. And enjoy yeah. the night and uh, crush some dinner. Yeah, for sure. You guys have a good one. Thanks, guys. Take care, buddy. Yeah, yeah. Bootstrapped in the trenches, yeah. making moves. Go